Hello class, welcome to CCNA Voice Chapter 3, Understanding Cisco IP Phone Concepts and Registration. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Okay, we're going to look at the IP phone from Cisco and see how it connects to the Cisco Call Manager. First, if we flip the phone over and take a look at the ports on the back, there's some interesting ones to know about. There are typically two Ethernet ports side by side on the back of the phone. One is labeled SW for switch and the other is labeled PC. This is in fact a small Ethernet switch. It's a catalyst Ethernet switch from Cisco with only two ports. The SW port is designed to face towards the network and would plug into a real full Cisco switch. The PC port on the back of the phone is optional to connect a PC. A situation might arise where you have a PC plugged into an Ethernet port, say in an office, and there's not a second Ethernet port available for the phone you wish to place in that office. What you can do is unplug the PC from the wall and plug the PC into the PC Ethernet port on the phone and then plug the phone into the wall. The phone will then act as the switch for the PC and then connect into the network. Additional ports, there are another two little RJ11 ports. Those are the smaller connectors to the Ethernet RJ45, but look very similar. And these ports will have a symbol for a headset and a handset. The headset is of course a um, device that sits on your head and has a little speaker and a microphone and it's used for hands-free communication on the phone. Additionally, uh, there is a handset port, which is where the traditional phone handset plugs in. Another port is the RS-232 port. It has different labels on different phone models. It is sometimes called an option port or peripheral port. It is for adding additional components to the phone, like a second dial pad, um, a lighted, uh, pad of buttons that could be used to um, reach multiple departments or add additional lines to the phone. Let's talk about how we power the phone now that we have an idea of what ports are on the phone. We need to give the phone some power. This could be done through a traditional power brick, which is like uh, the way that we power up a lot of small appliances and it plugs into the wall outlet and a little plug plugs into the phone. The phone actually has a power plug port on the bottom of it, on the back, with the other ports I've talked about. But that's a little cumbersome to find a uh, available 110 outlet everywhere you want to put a phone. So the best way to power a phone is right over the Ethernet cable, and the following three solutions all do that. One is to just use an Ethernet switch that supports 8023AF power over Ethernet. Most of our Cisco switches in the lab offer this feature. If you look at the switch model number, it will always have the word PoE in it to identify that. Additionally, the front facing mode button lights on the Cisco switch will include one that says PoE. These will be good indicators that this is a PoE capable switch. Be aware that a PoE switch does not always have all ports on the switch that are PoE capable. You may have to look closely at the ports on the front as some of them may be labeled PoE. If so, then other ports that are not labeled PoE would not be powered. You will see this on the switches we have in our lab. You could also purchase patch panels that are PoE. The patch panel plugs into a 110 outlet and then will inject the power over Ethernet um, energy into the Ethernet cable after it's left the switch. The advantage of using one of these is if you already own an Ethernet switch and it's not PoE. Say you have a nice Cisco switch, it just doesn't have power over Ethernet, you can purchase um, a patch panel that will add the power over Ethernet. If you don't need to do power over Ethernet on all 24 or 48 ports, you might find it more cost effective to buy an inline power injector. This is the same idea as the patch panel, but only powers a single Ethernet port. These uh, injectors are a small plastic box that you plug into a 110 outlet, and then you plug the uh, phone's Ethernet into that, and it powers it. Let's take a look at them. I've got some pictures.
Okay, you can see all of those. And so this patch panel looks a little different. It has two plugs for every one device. You would plug the phone into the PoE port and then the corresponding LAN would have a cable that goes up to the switch. And the LAN port would be unpowered to go to the unpowered ethernet switch and the PoE port would be powered and you can see the power light on it. You could also buy an inline injector and you can see it would plug into a 110 outlet and then the PoE port would go towards the phone and the LAN port would go towards the unpowered switch. You could, of course, buy a traditional power brick and just plug your phone into the wall outlet and not have any power over the Ethernet cable. Let's talk VLAN concepts. This is really not covered in this curriculum. You're expected to understand VLANs, but we'll do a quick rehearsal. VLANs use 802.1Q tags. This is a special message, a number, which is inserted into the Layer 2 Ethernet frame header. This tag is added when a frame enters an access port. The tag is removed when a frame leaves an access port. So frames arriving at an access port never have tags. They are tagged once they arrive at the access port. Also, when they egress or leave an access port, the tag is removed. On a trunk port, frames arrive tagged and they leave tagged. So trunk ports, all the frames are tagged. Trunks need the tags because that one port will carry traffic for multiple VLANs and the tags are the only way to keep track of which frame goes to which VLAN. An access port doesn't have that problem because it only belongs to one and only one VLAN. Let's move on to the IP phone boot process. When you plug in the phone, it needs to receive power. You're either going to plug it into a power brick, which would be the wall outlet, or you're going to get the power over the Ethernet cable from a power device, a PoE device. So that's step one. You have to get some power to the phone. Once it gets power, it will go through on a post or power on self test, where it will check its main systems and uh, start to boot. The first thing the phone is going to do is do CDP, which is Cisco Discovery Protocol, and it will receive a CDP message from the switch telling it which VLAN to use. Once the phone knows which VLAN to use to communicate on, it will send its DHCP request out that VLAN. The DHCP server will have to be equipped to send an option 150, which is an additional setting in addition to the IP address and the mask and the gateway and DNS and any other information that would normally be conveyed through a DHCP process, the DHCP server will also want to additionally include the option 150, which is simply the IP address of the TFTP server. The TFTP server is critical to the phone because it will be the location where the phone's configuration file was stored. Phones do not store their configuration file internally. They download them at boot up from a TFTP server, and they would have to learn where that server is from the DHCP server. So DHCP servers will include the IP address of a TFTP server, and they will deliver it with the option 150 title. The phone will recognize that IP and then contact the TFTP server using its own MAC address as the file name to request its configuration file. If one is there, the phone will download the configuration and in that configuration will be contained the IP address of the call manager that the phone is supposed to register to. The phone knowing this will now use that information to contact that call manager and attempt to register. Again, it will provide its MAC address as proof of who it is um, for the registration process. And if the call manager has been programmed with that MAC address, it will return information like which extension to use, um, the extension number and the names to put on the phone and all the relevant information and the phone will now be um, ready to go. NTP. I didn't write anything down for this one. It's critical that you configure NTP. Network time protocol means that your logs, 
are consistently date and time stamp means that your configuration files have the correct date and time stamp. So all of your devices, your DHCP server, your TFTP server, your call manager, they all need to have NTP. Additionally, if they are correctly running NTP, the phone will display the correct date and time. So NTP is really a critical part of having a well-running voice network. Let's talk about the registration process. The prerequisites before a phone can register, it has to be on a network with PoE or a power brick. It has to receive DHCP, so if the phone can't access a DHCP server, well, it won't be able to reach a TFTP server. And if it can't reach a TFTP server, well, it won't be able to um, know where the call manager is to register. Additionally, you would want to make sure NTP was up and working and that you had correct routing. If you could not ping between the phone and the call manager, you would not have met the prerequisites for the phone to register. The phone will register trying one of two protocols, either SCCP or Skinny. This must be configured in the configuration on the call manager and on the phone, and they must match. So if the call manager is expecting the phone to be using SCCP, the phone has to have a configuration file that uses SCCP. SCCP is Cisco proprietary and sometimes referred to as skinny. SIP is the industry standard that does the same thing and is superseding SCCP. Within a few years, SCCP will probably be obsolete as SIP overtakes it. And as I've mentioned before, the phone provides its burned in address or MAC address as proof of who it is um, in order to register with the call manager. In summary, this short chapter covered IP phone ports, how the phone receives power, the process the phone goes through when it boots, a review of VLANs, a quick mention of NTP and its importance, and a look at IP phone registration.